I intend to narrate chapters 6 to 10 of The Human Aura by Swami Pachadasi. This book is already narrated in, in full and can be found on BitChute by someone else. But at present, only these chapters from 6 onwards are of interest to me. A quick summary of the first couple chapters is talking about what the human aura is, um, the different layers of the aura and what they're all for, including the prana aura, uh, what the colors mean, the correspondences between particular modes of manifestation and emotions. Uh, there's also talk about how the auras of people end up coloring uh, particular areas. So there's a general atmosphere around churches, prisons, hospitals, etc. Chapter 6, Thought Forms That interesting phase of occult phenomena known as thought forms is so closely related to the general subject of the human aura that a mention of one must naturally lead to the thought of the other. Thought forms are built up of the very material composing the aura and manifest all of the general characteristics thereof, even to the auric colors. An understanding of the facts of the human aura is necessary for a correct understanding of the nature of the thought forms composed of the same substance. A thought form is a peculiar manifestation of mental activity on the astral plane. It is more than a powerful disturbance in the body of the human aura, although this is the place of its embodiment or birth in the objective world. It is formed in the following manner. A person manifests a strong desire, feeling, or idea, which is naturally filled with the dynamic force of his will. This sets up a series of strong vibrations in the body of the aura, which gradually resolve themselves into a strong whirling center of thought force involved in a mass of strongly cohesive auric substance and strongly charged with the power of the prana of the person. In some cases, these thought forms survive in the auric body for some little time and then gradually fade away. In other cases, they survive and maintain an almost independent existence for some time and exert a strong influence upon other persons coming in the presence of the person. Again, these thought forms may be stro strongly charged with prana and so imbued with the mental force of the person that they will actually be thrown off and away from the aura itself and travel in space until they exhaust their initial energy. In the meantime, exerting an influence upon the psychic aura of other persons. A thought form is more than merely a strongly manifested thought. It really is such a thought, but surrounded by a body of ethereal substance, charged with prana, and even carrying with it the vibration of the life energy of its creator. It is a child of the mind of its creator, and acquires a portion of its life essence, so to speak which abides with it for a longer or shorter time after its birth. In extreme instances, it becomes practically a semi-living elemental force of necessarily comparatively short life. To those who find it difficult to understand how a thought form can persist after separation from the presence of the thinker, I would say that the phenomena is similar to that of light traveling in space long after the star which originated it has been destroyed. Or, Again, it is like the vibrations of heat remaining in a room after a lamp or stove causing it has been removed, or the fire in the grate having died out, or like the sound waves of the drum beat persisting after it had beat itself has ceased. It is all a matter of the persistence of vibrations. Thought forms differ greatly one from the other in the matter of shape and general appearance. The most common and simple form is that of an undulating wave or a series of tiny waves resembling the circles caused by the dropping 
of a pebble into a still pond. Another form is that of a tiny rotating bit of cloud-like substance, sometimes swirling towards the central point, like a whirlpool, and sometimes swirling away from the central point, like the familiar pinwheel, fireworks toy. Another form is akin the ring of smoke projected from the coughing locomotive, or the rounded lips of the cigar smoker, the movement in this kind being a form of spiral rotation. Other thought forms have the appearance of swiftly rotating balls of cloudy substance, often glowing with a faint phosphorescence. Sometimes the thought form will appear as a great slender jet, like steam ejected from the spout of a tea kettle, which is sometimes broken up into a series of short, puffed out jets, each following the jet preceding it and traveling in a straight line. Sometimes the thought form shoots forth like a streak of dim light, almost resembling a beam of light flashed from a mirror. Occasionally, it will twist its way along like a long, slender corkscrew or auger boring into space. In cases of thought form sent forth by explosive emotion, the thought form will actually take the form of a bomb, which literally explodes when it reaches the presence of the person toward whom it is aimed. Every person has experienced this feeling of a thought bomb having ex been exploded in his near vicinity, having been directed by a vigorous personality. This form is frequently found in the thought form sent out by a strong, earnest, vigorous orator. There are strong thought forms which seem to strive to push back the other person, so correctly do they represent the idea and feeling back of their manifestation. Others seem to strive to win around the other person and to try to literally drag him toward the first person. This form often accompanying strong appeal, persuasion, coaxing, etc., when accompanied by strong desire. A particularly vigorous form of this kind of thought form takes on the appearance of a nebulous octopus with long winding cling tentacles striving to wrap around the other person and to draw him toward the center. The force of the feeling behind the manifestation of the thought form will often travel a long distance from the center. In fact, in cases of great power of concentration, space seems to be no barrier to its passage. In striking instances of thought transference, etc., it will be found that thought forms play an important part. The variety of shapes of thought forms is almost endless. Each combination of thought and feeling creates its own form, and each individual seems to have its own peculiarities in this respect. The forms I have above described, however, will serve as typical cases to illustrate the more common classes of appearances. The list, however, might be indefinitely expanded from the experience of any experienced occultist, and is not intended to be full by any means. All varieties of geometrical forms are found among the thought forms, some of them being of remarkable beauty. In considering the subject of projected thought forms, moreover, it must be remembered that they partake of and manifest the same colors as does the aura itself, for they are composed of the same material and are charged with the same energy. But note this difference, that whereas the aura is energized from the constant battery of the organism of the individual, the thought form, on the contrary, has added service only the energy with which it was charged when it was thrown off being a storage battery, as it were, which in time expends all of its power and then is powerless. Every thought form bears the same color that it would possess if it had been retained in the body of the ore itself, but, as a rule, the colors are plainer and less blended with others, this because each thought form is a representation of a single definite feeling or thought or a group of same instead of
being a body of widely differing mental vibrations. Thus, the thought form of anger will show its black and red, with its characteristic flashes. The thought form of passion will show forth in its appropriate auric colors and general characteristics. The thought form of high ideal love will show its beautiful form and harmonious tinting, like a wonderful celestial flower from the garden of some far-off paradise. Many thought forms never leave the outer limits of the aura, while others are projected to great distances. Some sputter out as they travel and are disintegrated, while others continue to glow like a piece of heated iron for many hours. Others persist for a long time with faint phosphorescent glow. A careful study of what has been said regarding the characteristics of the various feelings and emotions as manifested in the auric body will give the student a very fair general idea of what may be the appearance of any particular variety of thought form. For a general principle runs through the entire series of auric phenomena, an understanding of the fundamental principles will lead to an understanding of any of the particular varieties of the manifestation thereof. Finally, remember this. A thought form is practically a bit of the detached aura of a person, charged with a degree of his prana, and energized with a degree of his life energy. So, in a limited sense, it really is a projected portion of his personality. Chapter 7. Psychic Influence of Colors In all of nature's wonderful processes, we find many evidences of that great principle of action and reaction, which, like the forward and backward swing of the pendulum, changes cause into effect, and effect into cause in a never-ending series. We find this principle in effect in the psychic relation of mental states and colors. That is to say that just as we find that certain mental and emotional states manifest in vibrations causing particular auric astral colors, so do we find that the presence of certain colors on the physical plane will have a decided psychic effect upon the mental and emotional states of individuals subject to their influence. And, as might be expected by the thoughtful student, the particular astral colors manifested in the aura by the presence of some particular mental or emotional state exactly correspond with the particular physical colors which influence that particular mental or emotional state. Illustrating the statements in the preceding paragraph, I would say that the continued presence of red will be apt to set up emotional vibrations of anger, passion, physical love, etc. Or, in a different tent, the higher physical emotions. Blue, of the right tent, will tend to cause feelings of spirituality, religious emotion, etc. Green is conducive to feelings of relaxation, repose, quiet, etc. Black produces the feelings of gloom, and grief, and so on. Each color tends to produce emotional vibrations similar to those which manifest that particular color in the astral aura of the person. It is a case of give and take along the entire scale of color and emotions according to the great natural laws. While the explanation of these facts is not known to the average person, 
Nevertheless, nearly everyone recognizes the subtle effect of color and avoids certain colors while seeking certain others. There is not a single living human being but who has experienced the sense of rest, calm, repose, and calm and flow of in strength. When in a room decorated in quiet shades of green, nature herself has given this particular shade to the grass and leaves of trees and plants, so that the soothing effect of the country scene is produced. The aura of a person experiencing these feelings and yielding to them will manifest precisely the tint or shade of green which is shown on the grass and leaves around him. So true is this natural law of action and reaction. The effect of scarlet upon animals, the bull, for instance, is well known, to use the familiar term. It causes one to see red. The sight of the color of blood is apt to arouse feelings of rage or disgust by reason of the same law. The sight of the beautiful clear blue sky tends to arouse feelings of reverence, awe, or spirituality. One can never think of this shade of blue arousing rage or red arousing feelings of spirituality. It is a well-known fact that in insane asylums, the use of red in decorations must be avoided, while the proper shades of blue or green are favored. On the other hand, the use of a proper red, in certain cases, will tend to arouse vitality and physical strength in a patient. It is not by mere chance that the life-giving blood is a bright red rich red color when it leaves the heart. When one feels blue, he does not have the impression of a bright or soft blue, but he really is almost conscious of the presence of a dull bluish gray, and the presence of such a color in one's surroundings tends to cause a feeling of depression. Everyone knows the effect of a gray day in the fall or spring. Again, who does not know the feeling of mental exaltation coming from the sight of a day filled with golden sunshine or from a golden sunset? We find proofs of this law of nature on all sides, every day of our lives. It is an interesting subject which will repay the student for the expenditure of a little time and thought upon it. Speaking of the general class characteristics of the three primary groups of colors, all occultists, as well as many physiologists and psychologists, are agreed on the following fundamental proposition, viz. that 1. Red is exciting to the mind and emotions. 2. Yellow is inspiring and elevating and intellectually stimulating. And 3. Blue is cool, soothing, and calming. It is also universally conceded that the right shades of green, combining the qualities of blue and yellow in appropriate proportions, is the ideal color of rest and recuperation, followed by a stimulation and new ambition. The reason for this may be seen when you consider the respective qualities of blue and yellow which compose this color. It is interesting to note that the science of medicine is now seriously considering the use of colors in the treatment of disease, and the best medical authorities investigating in this subject are verifying the teachings of the old occultists regarding the influence of colors on mental states and physical conditions. Dr. Edwin Babbitt, a pioneer in this line in the Western world, gave the general principles in a nutshell when he laid down the following rule. There is a triannal series of graduations in the peculiar potencies of colors, the center and climax of electrical action, which cools the nerves being in violet, the climax of electrical action, 
which is soothing to the vascular system, being in blue, the climax of luminosity being in yellow, and the climax of firmism or heat being in red. This is not an imaginary division of qualities, but a real one, the flame-like red color having a principle of warmth in itself, the blue and violet a principle of cold and electricity. Thus, we have many styles of chromatic action, including progression of hues, of lights and shades, of fineness and coarseness, of electrical power, luminous power, thermal power, etc. Read the buff statement of Dr. Babbitt and then compare it with the cult teaching regarding the astral colors, and you will perceive the real basis of the science which the good doctor sought to establish, and in which, because he did such excellent pioneer work, the result of this work is now being elaborated by modern physicians in the great schools of medicine, particularly on the continent, in Europe, England and America being somewhat behind the times in this work. The advanced cultist also finds much satisfaction in the interest on the part of physicians and jurists in the matter of the influence of color upon the mental, moral, and physical welfare of the public. The effect of color upon morality is being noticed by workers for human welfare, occupying important offices. The American journals report the case of a judge in a large western city in that country who insisted upon his courtroom being decorated in light, cheerful tents instead of in the old, gloomy, depressing shades formerly employed. This judge wisely remarked that brightness led to right thinking and darkness to crooked thinking. Also, that his court, being an uplift court, must have walls to correspond, and that it was enough to turn any man into a criminal to be compelled to sit in a dark, dismal courtroom day after day. This good judge who must have had some acquaintance with the cult teachings, is quoted as concluding as follows. White, cream, light yellow, and orange are the colors which are the sanest. I might add light green, for that is the predominant color in nature. Black, brown, and deep red are incentives to crime. A man in anger sees red. Surely, a remarkable utterance from the bench. The effect of color schemes upon the moral and mental welfare of persons is being recognized in the direction of providing brighter color schemes in schools, hospitals, reformatories, prisons, etc. The reports naturally show the correctness of the underlying theory. The color of a tiny flower has its effect upon even the most hardened prisoner. While the minds of children in school are quickened by a touch of brightness here and there in the room, it needs no argument to prove the beneficial effect of the right kind of colors in the sick room or hospital ward. The prevailing theories and practice regarding the employment of color in therapeutics and human welfare work are in the main correct, but I urge the study of the cult significance of color, as mentioned in this book, in connection with the human aura and its astral colors, as a sound basis for an intelligent, thorough understanding of the real psychic principles underlying the physical application of the methods referred to. Go to the center of the subject and then work outward. That is the true rule of the occultist, which might well be followed by the non-occult general public. Chapter 8. Auric Magnetism. 
The phenomenon of human magnetism is too well recognized by the general public to require argument at this time. Let the scientists dispute about it as much as they please. Down in the heart of nearly all of the plain people of the race is the conviction that there is such a thing. The occultists, of course, are quite familiar with the wonderful manifestations of this great natural force and with its effect upon the minds and bodies of members of the race and can afford to smile at the attempts of some of the narrow minds in the colleges to poo-poo the matter. But the average person is not familiar with the relation of this human magnetism to the human aura. I think that the student should familiarize himself with this fundamental relation in order to reason correctly on the subject of human magnetism. Here is the fundamental fact in a nutshell. The human aura is the great storehouse or reservoir of human magnetism and is the source of all human magnetism that is projected by the individual toward other individuals. Just how human magnetism is generated is, of course, a far deeper matter, but it is enough for our purpose at this time to explain the fact of its storage and transmission. In cases of magnetic healing, etc., the matter is comparatively simple. In such instances, the healer, by an effort of the will, sometimes unconsciously applied, projects a supply of his pranic aura vibrations into the body of his patient by way of the nervous system of the patient, and also by means of what may be called the induction of the aura itself. The mere presence of a person strongly charged with prana is often enough to cause an overflow into the aura of other persons with a resulting feeling of new strength and energy. By the use of the hands of the healer, a heightened effect is produced by reason of certain properties inherent in the nervous system of both healer and patient. There is even a flow of, of etheric substance from the aura of the healer to that of the patient in cases where the vitality of the later is very low. Many a healer has actually and literally pumped his life force and etheric substance into the body of his patient when the later was sinking into a weakness which precedes death and has by so doing been able to bring him back to life and strength. This is practically akin to the transfusion of blood, except that it is on the psychic plane instead of the physical. But the work of the magnetic healer does not stop here. If he be well informed regarding this science, the educated healer realizing the potent effect of mental states upon physical conditions, of mental vibrations upon the physical nerve centers and organs of the body, endeavors to arouse the proper mental vibrations in the mind of his patient. Ordinarily, he does this merely by holding in his mind the corresponding desired mental state, and thus arousing similar vibrations in the mind of the patient. This, of itself, is a powerful weapon of healing, and constitutes the essence of mental healing as usually practiced. But there is a possible improvement even upon this, as we shall see in a moment. The advanced occultist, realizing the law of action and reaction in the matter of the auric colors, turns the same to account in healing work, as follows. He not only holds in his mind a strong feeling and thought which he wishes to transmit to the patient, but, fix this in your mind, he also pictures in his imagination the particular kind of color which corresponds with the feeling or thought in question. A moment's thought will show you that, by this course, he practically multiplies the effect. Not only do his own thought vibrations, one, set up corresponding vibrations in the mind of the patient by the laws of thought transference, but two, his thought of the certain colors 
will set up corresponding vibrations not only a in his own aura and thence b to that of the patient but will also three act directly upon the aura of the patient and reproduce the colors there which four in turn will arouse corresponding vibrations in the mind of the patient by the law of reaction the above may sound a little complicated at first reading but a little analysis will show you that it is really quite a simple process. Acting strictly along the lines of action and reaction, which law has been explained to you in preceding chapters of this book? The vibrations rebound from mind to aura and from aura to mind in the patient, something like a billiard ball flying from one side of the table to another, or a tennis ball flying between the two rackets over the net. The principle herein mentioned may be employed as well in what is called absent treatment, as in treatments where the patient is present. By the laws of thought transference, not only the thought but also the mental image of the appropriate astral color is transmitted over space and then, impinging on the mind of the patient, is transmitted into helpful and health-giving vibrations in his mind. The healer of any school of mental or spiritual healing will find this plan very helpful to him in giving absent as well as present treatments. I recommend it from years of personal experience as well as that of other advanced occultists. Of course, the fact that the ordinary healer is not able to distinguish the finer shades of astral color by reason of his not having actually perceived then manifested in aura, renders his employment of this method less efficacious than that of the developed and trained occultists. But, nevertheless, he will find that, from the knowledge of the auric or astral colors given in this title book, he will be able to obtain quite satisfactory and marked results in his practice. The following table, committed to memory, will be of help to him in the matter of employing the mental image of the auric colors in his healing work. Table of Healing Colors Nervous System Cooling and Soothing Shades of Violet, Lavender, etc. Resting and Invigorating Effect Grass Greens Inspiring and illuminating, medium yellows and orange. Stimulating and exciting, reds, bright. Blood and organs, cooling and soothing, clear dark blues. Resting and vigorating, grass greens. Inspiring and illuminating, orange yellows. Stimulating and exciting, bright reds. The following additional suggestions will be found helpful to the healer. In cases of impaired physical vitality, also chilliness, lack of bodily warmth, etc., bright warm reds are indicated. In case of feverishness, overheated blood, extensive blood pressure, inflammation, etc., blue is indicated. Red has a tendency to produce renewed and more active heart action, while violets and lavenders tend to slow down the too rapid beating of the heart. A nervous, unstrung patient may be treated by bathing her mentally in a flood of violent or lavender aura color, while a tired, used-up, fatigued person may be invigorated by flooding him with bright reds, followed by bright, rich yellows, finishing the treatment with a steady flow of warm orange color. To those who are sufficiently advanced in occult philosophy, I would say that they should remember the significance of the great white light and accordingly conclude their treatment by an effort to indicate an approach to that clear, pure white color and no aura, mentally, of course. This will leave the patient in an inspired, exalted, illuminated state of mind and soul, which will be of great benefit to him and will also have the effect of reinvigorating the healer by cosmic energy or paraprana. Everything that has been said in this chapter regarding the use of color and magnetic treatments is equally applicable to cases of self-healing or self-treatment. Let the patient follow the directions above given for the healer, and then turn the healing current 
or thought inward, and the result will be the same as if he were treating another. The individual will soon find that certain colors fit his requirements better than others, in which case let him follow such experience in preference to general rules. For the intuition generally is the safest guide in such cases. However, it will be found that the individual experience will usually agree with the tables given above, with slight personal variations. Chapter 9. Developing the Aura When it is remembered that the aura of the individual affects and influences other persons with whom he comes in contact and is, in fact, an important part of his personality, it will be seen that it's important that the individual take pains to develop his aura in the direction of desirable qualities and to neutralize and weed out undesirable ones. This becomes doubly true when it is also remembered that, according to the law of action and reaction, the auric vibrations react upon the mind of the individual, thus intensifying and adding fuel to the original mental states which call them forth. From many point of view, it is seen to be an important part of self-development and character building to develop the aura according to scientific occult principles. In this work of aura development, there is found to be two correlated faces, namely, one, the direct work of flooding the aura with the best vibrations by means of holding in the mind clear, distinct, and repeated mental pictures of desirable ideas and feelings. And two, the added effect of mental images of the colors corresponding to the ideas and feelings which are deemed desirable and worthy of development. The first of the above-mentioned phases is probably far more familiar to the average student than is the second. This from the fact that the average student is apt to be more or less familiar with the teachings of the numerous schools or cults, which agree in the axiom that holding the thought tends to develop the mind of the individual along the particular lines of such thought. This is a correct psychological principle, for that matter, even when those practicing it do not fully understand all underlying facts. Mental faculties, like physical muscles, tend to develop by exercise and use, and any faculty may be developed and cultivated in this way. Another teaching of these same schools is that the character of the thought so held by the individual affects other persons with whom he comes in contact and in a way attracts to him objective things, persons, and circumstances in a harmony with such thoughts. This also is in accordance with the best occult teaching, from which, of course, it was originally derived. I heartily endorse the facts of these teachings, and pronounce them fundamentally correct. And, in this connection, I may say that every healer may apply his own methods, plus this teaching regarding Laura, and thus obtain greatly increased results. By the faithful, persevering, holding in mind of certain ideas and feelings, the individual may flood his aura with the vibrations and colors of such ideas and feelings, and thus charge it with auric energy and power. By so doing, he gains the benefit of the reaction upon his own mind, and also secures the advantage of the effect thereof upon other persons with whom he comes in contact. In this way, he not only builds up his individual character along desirable lines, but at the same time develops a strong, positive, attractive personality, which affects others with whom he comes in contact. I do not consider it necessary to go into details here regarding this phase of holding the thought, for, as I have said, the average student is already familiar with the rules regarding the same. In a nutshell, however, I will say that each individual is largely the result of the thoughts he has manifested and the feelings which he has harbored. Therefore, the rule is to manifest and exercise the faculties you would develop and inhibit or refrain from manifesting the ones you would restrain or control. Again, to restrain an undesirable faculty, develop and exercise its opposite. Kill out the negatives by developing the positives. The mind produces thought, and yet it tends to grow from the particular portion of its own product which you may choose to feed to it. For it not only creates thought, but also feeds upon it. So, finally, let it produce the best kind of thought for you, 
and then throw that back into the hopper for it will use it to grind out more of the same kind and grow strong in so doing. That is the whole thing in a nutshell. The second phase of aura development, as above classified, however, is not likely to be a familiar to the average student, for the reason that it is not known outside of advanced occult circles, and very little has been allowed to be taught regarding it. But the very patient reticence regarding it is a proof of its importance. And I strongly advise my students to give it to the, the attention and practice that its importance merits. The practice thereof, however, is extremely simple and the practice, the principle of the practice, moreover, is based solely upon the facts of the relation of color and mental states as shown in the astral auric colors as fully explained in preceding chapters of this book. In order to intelligently practice the development of the aura by means of flooding or charging it with the vibrations of psychic colors, it is first necessary that the student be thoroughly familiar with the scale of colors related to each set of mental states or emotional feelings. This scale, and its key, is found in a number of places in the preceding chapters. The student should turn back the pages of this book and then carefully reread and restudy every word which has been said about the relation of mental state and auric colors. He should know the mental correspondence of the shades of red, yellow, and blue so thoroughly that the thought of one will bring the idea of the other. He should be able to think of the corresponding group of colors the moment he thinks of any particular mental state. He should be thoroughly familiar with the physical, mental, and spiritual effects of any of the colors, and should moreover test himself psychically for the individual effects of certain colors upon himself. He should enter into this study with interest and earnestness, and then by keeping his eyes and ears open, he will perceive interesting facts concerning the subject on every side in his daily walk in life. He will perceive many proofs of the principle and will soon amass a stock of experiences illustrating each color and its corresponding mental state. He will be richly repaid for the work of such study, which, in fact, will soon grow to be more like pleasure than like work. Having mastered this phase of the subject, the student should give himself a thorough, honest, self-examination and mental analysis. He should write down a chart of his strong points and his weak ones. He should check off the traits which should be developed and those which should be restrained. He should determine whether he needs development along physical, mental, and spiritual lines, and in what degree. Having made this chart of himself, he should then apply the principles of charging the aura with the color vibrations indicated by self-diagnosis and prescription. The last stage is quite simple, once one has acquired a general idea bit back of it, and consists simply in forming as clear a mental image as possible of the color or colors desired, and then projecting the vibrations into the aura by the simple effort of the will. This does not mean that one needs to clench the fist or frown the brow in willing. Willing, in the cult sense, may be said to consist of a command, leaving the rest of the mechanism of the will and mind to the mechanism of the will and mind. Take away the obstacle of doubt and fear, then the royal command performs the work of setting the will into operation. This, by the way, is an important occult secret of wide application. Try to master its all-important significance. The mental imaging of colors may be materially aided by concentration upon physical material of the right color. By concentrating the attention and vision upon a red flower, for instance, or upon a bit of green leaf in another instance, one may be able to form a clear, positive mental image of that particular color. This, accompanied by the willing and demand 
that the vibrations of this color shall charge the aura will be found to accomplish the result. Have something around you showing the desirable colors, and your attention will almost instinctively take up the impression thereof, even though you may be thinking of or doing something else. Live as much as possible in the idea and presence of the desirable color, and you will get the habit of setting up the mental image and vibration thereof. A little practice and experience will soon give you an idea and enable you to get the best results. Patience, perseverance, and sustained earnest interest. That is the key of success. Chapter 10, The Protective Aura. Among the very oldest of the teachings of occultism, we find instructions regarding the building up and maintenance of the protective aura of the individual whereby he renders himself immune to undesirable physical, mental, psychic, or spiritual influences. So important is this teaching that it is to be regretted that there has not been more said on the subject by some of the writers of recent years. The trouble with many of these recent writers is that they seem to wish to close their eyes to the unpleasant facts of life and to gaze only upon the pleasant ones. But this is a mistake, for ignorance has never been a virtue and to shut one's eyes to unpleasant facts does not always result in destroying them. I consider any teaching unfinished and inadequate which does not include instruction along protective lines. Physical auric protection consists in charging the aura with vital magnetism and color, which will tend to ward off not only the physical contagion of ill persons, but, what is often still more important, the contagion of their mind and feelings. The student who has really studied preceding chapters will at once realize that this protection is afforded by filling the aura with the vibrations of health and physical strength, by means of the mental imaging of the life-preserving reds, and the exercise of the mind in the direction of thought, of strength, and power. These two things will tend to be greatly increase the resistive aura of anyone, enable them to throw off disease influences which affect others. The aura of the successful physician and healer in the presence of disease will invariably show the presence of the bright positive red in aura, accompanied by the mental vibrations of strength, power, and confidence, and the absence of fear. This, in connection with the auric circle, which shall be described presently, will be of great value to healers, physicians, nurses, etc., as well as to those who are brought into intimate contact with sick persons. Of practically the same degree of importance is the charging of the aura with the vibrations of mental protection, viz. the vibrations of orange, yellow, and similar colors. These are colors of intellect, you will remember, and when the aura is charged and flooded with them, it acts as a protection against the efforts of others to convince one against his will by sophisticated arguments plausible reasoning, fallacious illustrations, etc. It gives to one a sort of mental illumination, quickening the perceptive faculties and brightening up the reasoning and judging powers, and finally, giving a sharp edge to the powers of repartee and answer. If you will assume the right positive mental attitude, it will flood your aura with the vibrations of the mental orange-yellow, the mental efforts of our persons will brown rebound from your aura, or, to use another figure of speech, will slip from it like water from the back of the proverbial duck. It is well to carry the mental image of your head being surrounded by a golden aura or a halo at such times. This will be found especially efficacious as a protective helmet when you are assaulted by the intellect or arguments of others. And, again, there is a third form of protective aura, namely protection of one's emotional nature. And this is highly important when one remembers how frequently we are moved to action by our emotions, rather than our, by our intellect or reason. To guard one's emotions is to guard one's very inmost soul, so to speak. If we can protect our feeling and emotional side, we'll be able to use our reasoning powers and intellect far more effectively, as all know by experience. 
What color should we use in this form of aura protection? Can anyone be in doubt here if he has read the preceding chapters? What is the emotional protective color? Why blue, of course. Blue controls this part of the mind or soul. And by raising ourselves into the vibrations of positive blue, we leave behind us the lower emotions and feelings and are transported into higher realms of the soul where these low vibrations and influence cannot follow us. In the same way, the blue-colored aura will act as an armor to protect us from the contagion of the low passions and feelings of others. If you are subjected to evil influences or contagion of those harboring low emotions and desires, you will do well to acquire the act of flooding your aura with the positive blue tints. Make a study of bright clear blues, and you will instinctively select the one best suited for your needs. Nature gives us this instinctive knowledge, if we will but seek for it, and then apply it when found. The aura of great moral teachers, great priests and preachers, advanced occultists, in fact all men of lofty ideals working among those lower on the moral scale, are always found to be charged with a beautiful clear blue which acts as a protection to them when they are unduly exposed to moral or emotional contagion. Ignorance of the cult laws have caused the downfall of many a great moral teacher who could have protected himself in this way in times of strong attack of low vibrations had he but known the truth. The individual who knows this law and who applies it is rendered absolutely immune from evil contagion on the emotional plane of being. The Great Auric Circle But no occult instruction on this subject would be complete without a reference to a Great Auric Circle of Protection, which is a shelter to the soul, mind, and body against outside psychic influences directed consciously or unconsciously against the individual. In these days of widespread through imperfect knowledge of psychic phenomena, it is especially important that one should be informed as to this great shield of protection, omitting all reference to the philosophy underlying it. It may be said that this auric circle is formed by making the mental image accompanied by demand of will of the aura being surrounded by a great band of pure, clear, white light. A little perseverance will enable you to create this on the astral plane and, though unless you have the astral vision, you cannot see it actually, yet you will actually feel its protective presence so that you will know that it is there and guarding you. This white auric circle will be an effective and infallible armor against all forms of psychic attack or influence no matter from whom it may emanate, or whether directed consciously or unconsciously. It is a perfect and absolute protection, and knowledge of its protective power should be sufficient to drive fear from the heart of all who have dreaded psychic influence, malicious animal magnetism, so-called, or anything else of the kind, by whatever name known. It is also a protection against psychic vampirism or draining of magnetic strength. The auric circle is, of course, really egg-shaped, or oval, for it fringes the aura as the egg cases the egg. See yourself, mentally, as surrounded by this great white auric circle of protection, and let the idea sink into your consciousness. Realize its power over and influences from outside, and rejoice in immunity it gives you. The auric circle, however, will admit any outside impressions that you really desire to come to you, while shutting out the others. That is, with this exception, that if your inner soul recognizes that some of these desired influences and impressions are apt to harm you, though your reason and feeling know it not, then will such impressions be denied and admitted. For the white light is the radiation of spirit, which is higher than ordinary mind, emotion, or body, and is master of all. And its power, even though we can but imperfectly represent it even mentally, is such that before its energy and in its presence in the aura, all lower vibrations are neutralized 
and disintegrated. The highest and deepest occult teaching is that the white light must never be used for purpose of attack or personal gain but that it may properly be used by anyone at any time to protect against outside psychic influences against which the soul protests. It is the armor of the soul and may well be employed whenever or wherever the need arises. Throughout the pages of this little book have been scattered crumbs of teaching other than those concerning the aura alone. Those for whom these are intended will recognize and appropriate them. Others will not see them and will pass them by. One attracts his own to him. Much seed must fall on waste places in order that here and there a grain will find lodgment in rich soil awaiting its coming. True occult knowledge is practical power and strength. Beware of prostituting the higher teachings for selfish ends and ignoble purposes. To guard and preserve your own will is right. To seek to impose your own will upon that of another is wrong. Passive resistance is often the strongest form of resistance. This is quite different from non-resistance. The End Despite what I have said about reading only from chapter 6 to 10, I think I will read chapter 2 now. The Prana Aura Many writers on the subject of the human aura content themselves with a description of the colors of the mental or emotional aura and omit almost any reference whatsoever to the basic substance or power of the aura. This is like the play of Hamlet, with the character of Hamlet omitted. For, unless we understand something concerning the fundamental substance of which the aura is composed, we cannot expect to arrive at a clear understanding of the phenomena which arises from and by reason of the existence of this fundamental substance. We might as well expect the student to understand the principles of color without having been made acquainted with the principles of light. The fundamental substance of which the human aura is composed is none other than that wonderful principle of nature of which one reads so much in all occult writings, which has been called by many names, but which is perhaps best known under the Sanskrit term prana, but which may be thought of as vital essence, life power, etc., It is not necessary in this book to go into the general consideration of the nature and character of prana. It is sufficient for us to consider it and its manifestations of vital force, life essence, etc. In its broadest sense, prana really is the principle of energy and nature. But in its relation to living forms, and it is the vital force which lies at the very basis of manifested life. It exists in all forms of living things, from the most minute microscopic form up to living creatures on higher planes, as much higher than man as man is higher than the simple microscopic life forms. It permeates them all and renders possible all life activity and functioning. Prana is not the mind or the soul, but is rather the force or energy through which the soul manifests activity, and the mind manifests thoughts. It is the steam that runs the physical and mental machinery of life. It is the substance of the human aura, and the colors of mental states are manifested in that substance, just as the colors of chemical bodies are manifested in the substance of water. But prana is not material substance. It is higher than mere matter, being the underlying substance of energy or force in nature. While it is true, as we have seen, that all auras are composed of the substance of prana, It is likewise true that it is a simple and elementary form of auric substance to which occultists have given the simple name of the prana aura in order to distinguish it from the more complex forms and phases of the human aura. The simplicity of the character of the prana aura causes it to be more readily sensed or perceived than is possible in the case of the more complex phases or forms of the aura. For whereas it is only the more sensitive organisms that can distinguish the finer vibrations of the mental and emotional aura, 
and only the clairvoyant sight which can discern its presence by its colors, almost any person, by a little careful experimenting, may become aware of the presence of the prana aura, not only in the way of feeling it, but in many cases of actually seeing it with the ordinary vision rightly directed. That which is known as the prana aura is, of course, the most simple form or phase of the human aura. It is the form or phase which is more closely bound up with the physical body and is less concerned with the mental state. This fact has caused some writers to speak of it as the health aura, or physical aura, both of which terms are fittingly applied as we shall see, although we prefer the simpler term we have used here, i.e. the prana aura, for the prana aura does not show the state of health of the individual rating it. It also really contains physical power and magnetism which may be and is imparted to others. The basic prana aura is practically colorless, that is to say, it is about the color of the clearless water or a very clear diamond. By the clairvoyant vision, it is seen to be streaked or marked by very minute, bristle-like lines radiating outward from the physical body of the individual, in a matter very like the quills upon the fretful porcupine, as Shakespeare puts it. In the case of excellent physical health, these bristle-like streaks are stiff and brittle-looking, Whereas, if the general health of the person be deficient, these bristle-like radiations seem to be more or less tangled, twisted, or curly, and in some cases present a drooping appearance. In extreme cases, present the appearance of soft, limp fur. Hmm. It may interest the student to know that minute particles of this prana aura or vital magnetism is sloughed off the body in connection with physical exhalation, such as scent, etc., and remain in existence for some time after the person has passed from the particular place at which they were cast off. In fact, as all cultists know, it is these particles of the prana aura which serve to give vitality to the scent of living creatures, which enables dogs and other animals to trace up the track of the person or animal for a long time after a person has passed. It is not alone the physical order, which must be very slight as you will see upon a moment's consideration. It is really the presence of the particles of the prana aura which enables the dog to distinguish the traces of one person among that of thousands of others. And the feet is as much physical as psychical. Another peculiarity of the prana aura is that it is filled with a multitude of extremely minute sparkling particles, resembling tiny electric sparks which are in constant motion. These sparks, which are visible to persons of only slightly developed psychic power, impart a vibratory motion to the prana aura, which under certain conditions is plainly visible to the average person. This vibratory movement is akin to the movement of heated air arising from a hot stove or from the heated earth on a midsummer day. If the student will close his eyes partially until he peers out from narrowed lids and will closely observe some very healthy person sitting in the dim light, he may perceive this undulating, pulsing vibration extending an inch or two from the surface of the body. It requires some little knack to recognize these vibrations, but a little practice will often give one the key, and after the first recognition, the matter becomes easy. Again, in the case of persons of active brains, one may perceive this pulsating prana aura around the head of the person, particularly when he is engaged in concentrated active thought. A little practice will enable almost anyone to perceive faintly the dim outlines of the prana aura around his own fingers and hand by placing his hand against a black background. In a dim light, and then gazing at it with narrowed eyelids, squinting if necessary. Under these circumstances, after a little practice, one will be apt to perceive a tiny outlined aura or radiation or halo of pale yellowish light surrounding the hand. By extending the fingers, fan shape, you will perceive that each finger is showing its own little outlined prana aura. The stronger the vital force, the plainer will be the perception of the phenomenon. Often, the prana aura in these experiments will appear like the semi-luminous radiance surrounding a candle flame or gas light. Under the best conditions, the radiation will assume an almost phosphorescent appearance, 
Remember, this is simply a matter of trained ordinary sight, not clairvoyant vision. This prana aura is identical with human magnetism, which is employed in ordinary magnetic healing. That is to say, it is the outer manifestation of the wonderful pranic force. It is felt when you shake hands or otherwise come in close physical contact with a strongly magnetic person. On the other hand, it is what the weakly human vampire-like persons unconsciously or consciously try to draw from strong person. If the later allowed him to so to do from want of knowledge of self protection. Who has not met persons of this kind who seem to sap one's very life force away from him? Remember, then, that the prana aura is the aura of radiation of life force or vital power, which is the steam of your living activity, physical and mental. It is the pouring out of vital steam, which is running your vital machinery. Its presence indicates life, its absence, lifelessness. The section I have highlighted here about the uh, minute sparkling particles resembling tiny electric sparks. I've seen those quite a few times. Finally, I would like to read this article on the aura from Montauk.net. We know several things about the human aura. It does not bend light, nor does it slow time. It doesn't change the strength of constant magnetic or electric fields. But what it does do is alter how easily certain forms of oscillating energy propagate through space. For example, Kirlian photography passes high voltage and high frequency electricity through an object the brighter and larger the sparks coming off the object and recorded onto grounded photographic film, the stronger the aura of the object. That is because electricity takes the path of least resistance or impedance in this case, and the aura changes the impedance of space itself along its filamentary substructures allowing oscillating high voltage electricity to follow those channels and press a corresponding bit upon the film. In another example, the life energy field meter based on Wilhelm Reich's organ detector uses a vacuum tube with alternating current flowing between the electrodes in the tube. The energy extends outside the tube and is called displacement current rather than electric current because it does not involve transfer of electrons. In the presence of an aura, the quantity of displacement current increases which registers on the life energy meter as a readout of the aura field strength. Displacement current. The displacement current is a longitudinal electrogravitational wave. It is analogous to energy passing through a slinky that is shoved at one end. A compressive ripple travels through to the other end. This is how a capacitor transmits energy via displacement current. So displacement current is energy transferred in the form of oscillating gravity waves. Mainstream science says that displacement current comes from the electric field of one electrode changing into a magnetic field and between that induces an electrical potential on another electrode. But this isn't exclusively true because if electrodes were one sphere inside another sphere, as in a spherical capacitor, all magnetic fields would cancel, but energy is still transmitted. See my paper at the Scalar Physics Research Center for the mathematical details. The displacement currents is really just a longitudinal electromagnetic wave, not in the sense of electric and magnetic fields traveling longitudinally, that is impossible just as science says, but rather the underlying magnetic vector potential component oscillating in the direction of travel. This also shows why the aura does not bend or discolor ordinary light, since it only affects longitudinal waves and not transverse waves. 
ordinary electromagnetic waves have both a magnetic and electric field component that oscillate transversely like a rope being shaken rather than a slinky being compressed. Point is that the aura seems to amplify the transmission of longitudinal or gravitational waves. Now, displacement current only exists when current is oscillating rather than constant. This means the aura affects only frequency fields and not static fields. In other words, the aura only affects gravity waves, not gravity fields. It does not change the gravitational field of the mass, and therefore objects don't get heavier or lighter necessarily in the presence of an aura. It would, however, affect the transmission of gravitational or electrogravitational waves. It is therefore a frequency resonance field that gives preference to any gravitational waves having a frequency in common with its own resonance spectrum. If stimulated, an aura will emit gravitational waves at its resonance spectrum, and these waves would essentially be the frequency resonance vibration, or FRV as the Cassiopeians call it. Interestingly, this suggests that physical matter, because it gives off a constant gravity field, has an FRV of, v of zero, and that living energy fields accentuate anything other than zero frequency. That which is living is just a higher on the gravitational vibrational spectrum than matter. In order to measure the aura, one could conceivably place an object between the plates of a capacitor, pass white noise through one plate, and record it on another. By subtracting the input white noise from the output white noise, all that is left is a series of peaks at the resonant frequencies of the object. But this is just an average value for the entire field of the object, and does not give individual values for individual points in the field as with Kirlian photography. There may be more elegant methods, while we need, what we need is a device that measures displacement current at a wide spectrum of frequencies. Solid state devices like a field effect transistor may work, as used by Chuck Schramack in his alleged aura camera. Hodonik's gravity wave detectors, which measure the self-excited potentials in capacitors, may also work if modified. This all relates to Townsend Brown's gravitators which applied the principle in reverse, charging a capacitor to produce a static gravity field. Temporal modulation field, but perhaps the aura isn't simply a passive resonance field in the sense of how water doesn't give off light, yet it does have a certain absorption and resonance spectrum with regard to EM waves passing through it. What if the aura is actively vibrating? Then it would be continuously emitting a broad spectrum of high frequency gravitational waves, and since gravity bends time, the aura would identically be a modulating temporal field. If you place the very sensitive clock in the auric field, in theory, the nanosecond hand would move slightly faster one moment, slightly slower the next moment, and thus oscillate in a rich vibratory manner corresponding to the spectrum of longitudinal waves comprising the aura. But since these oscillations average out to the regular time rate, we don't detect a net loss or gain of time on the clock, just a subtle flickering of the time rate. Here I am reading Lesson 9 of Clairvoyance and Occult Powers. Simple Clairvoyance. In a previous chapter, we have seen that there are three well-defined classes of clairvoyance, namely 1. Simple Clairvoyance. 2 clairvoyance in space, and three, clairvoyance in time. I shall now consider these in sequence, beginning with the first, simple clairvoyance. In simple clairvoyance, a clairvoyance person merely senses the auric emanations of other persons, such as the auric vibrations, colors, etc., currents of thought vibrations, etc., but does not see events or scenes removed in space or time from the observer. There are other phenomena peculiar to this class of clairvoyance, which I shall note as we progress with this chapter. An authority on the subject of astral phenomena has written interestingly as follows regarding some of the phases of simple clairvoyance. When we come to consider the additional facilities which it offers in observation of animate objects, as we still more clearly the advantages of astral vision, it exhibits to the clairvoyant 
the aura of plants and animals, and thus, in the case of the later, their desires and emotions, and whatever thoughts they may have, are all plainly shown before his eyes. But it is in dealing with human beings that he will most appreciate the value of this faculty, for he will often be able to help them far more effectually when he guides himself by the information which it gives him. He will be able to see the aura as far up as the astral body, and though that leaves all the higher parts of a man still hidden from his gaze, he will nevertheless find it possible, by careful observation, to learn a good deal about the higher part from what is within his reach. His capacity of examination of the theoric double will give him considerable advantage in locating and classifying any defects or diseases of the nervous system, while from the appearance of the astral body, he will at once be aware of all the emotions, passions, desires, and tendencies of the man before him, and even of very many of his thoughts also. As he looks at a person, he will see him surrounded by the luminous mist of the astral aura, flashing with all sorts of brilliant colors and constantly changing in hue and brilliancy with every variation of the person's thoughts and feelings. He will see this aura flooded with the beautiful rose color of pure affection, the rich blue of devotional feeling, the hard, dull brown of selfishness, the deep scarlet of anger, the horrible lurid red of sensuality, the livid gray of fear, the black clouds of hatred and malice, or any of the other hundredfold indications so easily to be read in it by the practice eye, and thus it will be impossible for any persons to conceal from him the real state of their feelings on any subject. Not only does the astral or shorm the temporary result of emotion passing through it at the moment, but it also gives him by an arrangement and proportion of his colors when in the condition of comparative rest a clue to the general disposition and character of its owner. By simple clairvoyance in a certain stage of development, the clairvoyant person is able to sense the presence of the human aura by means of his astral sight. The human aura, as all students of cultism know, is that peculiar emanation of astral vibrations that extends from each living human being, surrounding him in an egg-shaped form for a distance of two to three feet on all sides. This peculiar nebulous envelope is not visible to the physical sight and may be discerned by only by means of the astral senses. It, it, however, may be dimly felt by many persons coming into the presence of other persons and constitutes a personal atmosphere which is sensed by other persons. The term, the trained clairvoyant vision sees the human aura as a nebulous, hazy substance, like a luminous cloud surrounding the person for two or three feet on each side of his body, being more dense near the body and gradually becoming less dense as it extends away from the body. It has a phosphorescent appearance with a peculiar tremulous motion manifesting throughout its substance. The clairvoyant sees the human aura as composed of all the colors of the spectrum, the combinations shifting with the changing mental and emotional states of the person. But in a general way, it may be said that each person has his or her distinctive astral aura colors depending upon his or her general character or personality. Each mental state or emotional manifestation has its own particular shade or combination of shades of aura coloring. This beautiful kaleidoscopic spectacle has its own meaning to advance occultists with clairvoyant vision, for he is able to read the character and general mental states of the person by means of studying his astral aura colors. I have explained these aura colors and their meanings in my little book entitled The Human Aura. The human aura is not always in a state of calm phosphorescence. However, on the contrary, it sometimes manifests great flames like those of a fiery furnace, which shoot forth in great tongues and dart forth suddenly in certain directions toward the objects attracting them. Under great emotional excitement, the auric flames move around in swift swirling whirlpools or else swirl away from the center. Again, it seems to throw forth tiny glistening sparks of astral vibrations, some of which travel for great distance. 
The clairvoyant vision is also able to discern what is called the prana aura of a person. By this term is indicated that peculiar emanation of vital force which surrounds the physical body of each and every person. In fact, many persons of but slight clairvoyant power, who cannot sense the aura colors, are able to perceive this prana aura without trouble. It is sometimes called the health aura, or physical aura. It is colorless, or rather about the shade of clear glass, diamond, or water. It is streaked with very minute bristle-like lines. In a state of good health, these fine lines are stiff like toothbrush bristles, while in cases of poor health, these lines droop, curl, and present a fur-like appearance. It is sometimes filled with minute sparkling particles, like tiny electric sparks in rapid vibratory motion. To the clairvoyant vision of the prana aura, appears like the vibrating head air arising from a fire or stove or from the heated earth in summer. If his student will close his eyes partially and will peer through narrowed eyelids, he will in all probability be able to perceive this prana aura surrounding the body of some healthy, vigorous person, particularly if the person is sitting in a dim light. Looking closely, he will see pe the peculiar vibratory motion like heated air at a distance of about two inches from the body of the person. It requires a little practice in order to acquire the knack of perceiving these vibrations, a little experimenting in order to get just the right light on the person. But practice will bring success, and you will be repaid for your trouble. In the same way, the student may be, by practice, acquired a faculty to perceiving his own prana aura. The simplest way to obtain this last mentioned result is to place your fingers spread out in fan shape against a black background in a dim light. Then gaze at the fingers with narrowed eyelids and half-closed eyes. After a little practice, you will see a fine, thin line surrounding your fingers on all sides, a semi-luminous border of prana aura. In most cases, this border, border of aura is colorless, but sometimes a very pale, yellowish hue is perceived. The stronger the vital force of the person, the stronger and brighter will this border of prana aura appear. The aura surrounding the fingers will appear very much like the semi-luminous radiance surrounding a gas flame or the flame of a candle which is familiar to nearly everyone. Another peculiar phenomenon of the astral plane perceived by clairvoyance of a certain degree of development is that which is known as the thought form. A thought form is a specialized grouping of astral substance crystallized by the strong thought impulses or vibrations of a person thinking or manifesting strong emotional excitement. It is generated in the aura of the person in the first place, but is then thrown off or emitted from the atmosphere of the person and is sent off into space. A thought form is really but a strongly manifested thought or feeling which is taken form in the astral substance. Its power and duration depend upon the degree of force of the thought or feeling manifesting it. These thought forms differ very materially from one another in form and general appearance. The most common form is that of a tiny series of waves similar to those caused by the dropping of a pebble in a pond of water. Sometimes the thought form takes on the appearance of a whirlpool rotating around its center and moving through space as well. Another form is like that of the pinwheel fireworks, swirling away from its center as it moves through space. Still another form is that of a whirling ring like that emitted from a smokestack of a locomotive or the mouth of a smoker. The familiar ring of the smoker. Others have the form and appearance of semi-luminous globes, glowing like a giant opal. Other thought forms are emitted in jet-like streams, like steam puffed out from a tea kettle. Again, it will appear as a series of short puffs of steam-like appearance. Again, 
it will twist along like an eel or a snake. Another time, it will twist its way like a corkscrew. At other times, it will appear as a bomb or a series of bombs projected from the aura of the thinker. Sometimes, as in the case of a vigorous thinker or speaker, these thought form bombs may be seen to explode when they reach the aura of the person addressed or thought of. Other forms appear like nebulous things resembling an octopus whose twining tentacles twist around the person to whom they are directed. Each thought form bears the same color that is possessed when generated in the aura of its crater, though the colors seem to fade with time. Many of them glow with a dull phosphorescence instead of bright coloring. The atmosphere of every person and every place is filled with various thought forms emanated from the person or persons who inhabit the place. Each building has its own distinctive thought forms which permeate its mental atmosphere and which are clearly discernible by trained clairvoyant vision. I here take the liberty of quoting a few paragraphs from my little book entitled The Astral World, in which the phenomena of the astral plane are explained in detail. I reproduce them here in order to show you what you may see on the astral plane when your clairvoyant vision is sufficiently developed to function there. The words are addressed to one who is sensing on the astral plane. Notice that beautiful spiritual blues around that woman's head, and see that ugly medi red around that man passing her. Here comes an intellectual giant, see that beautiful golden yellow around his head, like a nimbus. But I don't exactly like that shade of red around his body, and there is too marked an absence of blue in his aura. He lacks harmonious development. Do you notice those great clouds of semi-luminous substance, which are slowly floating along? Notice how the colors vary in them. Those are clouds of thought vibrations, representing the composite thought of a multitude of people. Also notice how each body of thought is drawing to itself little fragments of similar thought forms and energy. You see here the tendency of thought forms to attract others of their kind, like how the proverbial birds of a feather, they flock together. How thoughts come home, bringing their friends with them. How each man creates his own thought atmosphere. Speaking of atmospheres, do you notice that each shop we pass has its own peculiar thought atmosphere? If you look into the houses on either side of the street, you will see that the same thing is true. The very street itself has its own atmosphere, created by the composite thought of those inhabiting and frequenting it. No, do not pass down that side street. Its astral atmosphere is too depressing, and its colors too horrible and disgusting for you to witness just now. You might get discouraged and fly back to your physical body for relief. Look at those thought forms flying through the atmosphere. What a variety of form and coloring. Some most beautiful, the majority quite neutral and ten, and occasionally a fierce fire one tearing its way along towards its mark. Observe those whirling and swirling thought forms as they are thrown off from that business house. Across the street, notice that great octopus monster of a thought form with its great tentacles striving to wind around persons and draw them into that flashy dance hall and dram shop. A devilish monster which we would do well to destroy. Turn your concentrated thought upon it and will it out of existence. There, that's the right way. Watch it sicken and shrivel, but alas, more of its kind will come forth from that place. The above represents the sl sites common to the advanced occultist to explore the astral plane either in his astral body or else by means of clairvoyant vision. To such a one, these sites are just as natural as those of the physical plane to the person functioning by ordinary physical senses. One is as natural as is the other. There is nothing supernatural about either. But there are other and even more wonderful attributes of astral visioning than that which we have just related. Let us take a general survey of these so that you may be familiar with what you hope to see on the astral plane and what you'll see when you have sufficiently developed your clairvoyant powers. What would you think if you could see through a brick wall? Well, the clairvoyant is able to do this. 
For that matter, the physical x-rays are able to penetrate through solid substances, and astral vibrations are even more subtle than these. It seems strange to hear of this kind of visioning as purely natural, doesn't it? It smacks strongly of the old supernatural tales, but it is as simply natural as is the x-ray. The advanced clairvoyant is able to see through the most solid objects, and inside of anything for that matter, the astral senses register the subtle vibrations of the astral plane, just as the physical eye registers the ordinary rays of light energy. You are able to see through solid glass with the physical eye, are you not? Well, in the same way, the clairvoyant sees through solid steel or granite. It is all a matter of registering vibrations of energy, nothing more and nothing less. It is in this way that the trained clairvoyant is able to read from closed books, sealed letters, etc. In the same way, he is able to pierce the dense soil and to see far down into the depths of the earth, subject to certain limitation. Veins of coal, oil, and other substances have been discovered clairvoyantly in this way. Not every clairvoyant is able to do this, but the advanced ones have done it. In the same way, the trained clairvoyant is able to see inside the bodies of sick persons and to diagnose their ailments, providing, of course, he is familiar with the appearance of the organs in health and in disease, and has a f sufficient knowledge of physiology and pathology to in interpret what he sees. An authority on the phenomena of the astral plane has written entertainingly and correctly regarding this phase of simple clairvoyance as follows. The possession of this extraordinary and scarcely expressive power, then, must always be borne in mind through all that follows. It lays every point in the interior of every solid body out absolutely open to the gaze of the seer, just as every point in the interior of a circle lies open to the gaze of a man looking down upon it. But even this is by no means all that it gives to its possessor. He sees not only the inside as well as the outside of every object, but also its astral counterpart. Every atom and molecule of physical matter has its corresponding astral atoms and molecules, and the mass which is built up out of these is clearly visible to clairvoyant. Usually the astral form of any object projects somewhat beyond the physical part of it, and plus metals, stones, and other things are seen surrounded by an astral aura. It will be seen at once that even in the study of inorganic matter, a man gains immensely by the acquisition of this vision. Not only does he see the astral part of the object at which he looks, which before was wholly hidden from him, not only does he see much more of his physical constitution than he did before, but even what was visible to him before is now seen much more clearly and truly. Another strange power of which he may find himself in possession is that of magnifying at will the minutest physical or astral particle to any desired size as through a microscope. No, no microscope ever made or ever likely to be made possesses even a thousandth part of, of this psychic magnifying power. By its means, the hypothetical molecule and atom postulated by science become visible and living realities to the cult student, and on this closer examination, he finds them to be much more complex in their structure than the scientific man has yet realized them to be. It also enables him to follow with the closest attention and the most lively interest, all kinds of electrical, magnetic, and other etheric action, and then some of the specialists in these branches of science are able to develop the powers to see these things, whereof they write so facilely, some very wonderful and beautiful revelations may be expected. This is one of the cities, or powers described in Oriental books, as accruing to the man who devotes himself to spiritual development. Through the name, though the name under which it is there mentioned might not be immediately recognizable. It is referred to as the power of making oneself large or small at will. And the reason of a description which appears so oddly to reverse the fact is that in reality the method by which this feat is performed is precisely that indicated by these ancient books. It is by the use of temporary visual machinery of inconceivable minuteness that the world of the infinitely little is so clearly seen, and in the same way, or rather in the opposite way, it is by enormously increasing the size of the machinery used 
that it becomes possible to increase the breadth of one's own one's view in the physical sense as well as let us hope in the moral far beyond anything that science has ever dreamt of as possible for man so that the alteration in size is really in the vehicle of the student's consciousness and not in anything outside of himself and the old oriental books have after all put the case more accurately than have we i have indicated though only in the roughest outlines what a trained student possessed the full astral vision would see in the immensely wider world to which that vision introduced him. But I have said nothing of the stupendous change in this, men in this mental attitude, which comes from the experimental certainty regarding matters of paramount importance. The difference between even the profoundest intellectual conviction and the precise knowledge gained by direct personal experience must be felt in order to be appreciated. Now, here at this place, I wish to call the attention of the student to the fact that while the above stated phenomena strictly belong to the class of simple clairvoyance, rather than to space clairvoyance or time clairvoyance, respectively, nevertheless, the same phenomena may be manifested in connection with that of these other classes of clairvoyance. For instance, in space clairvoyance, the trained clairvoyant is able to not only to perceive things happening at points far distant, but may also, if highly developed psychically, be able to perceive the details just mentioned as well as if he were at the distant point in person. Likewise, in time clairvoyance, the clairvoyant may exercise the power of magnifying vision regarding the object far distant in time, just as if we were living in that time. So, here as elsewhere, we find the different classes of phenomena shading and blending into each other. At the best, classifications are useful principally for convenience in intellectual consideration and reasoning. In the same way, the clairvoyant may manifest the above-mentioned forms of astral sensing in cases when the astral vision has been awakened by psychometry or by crystal gazing as well as in those cases in which the condition has been brought about through meditation or similar methods. I would also call the attention of the student to the fact that in above description of the phenomena of simple clairvoyance, I have made no mention of the sights of the astral plane, which often become visible to the clairvoyant and which have to do with astral bodies, astral shells, the disembodied souls of those who have passed on to other planes of existence, etc. I shall take up these matters in other parts of this course and shall not dwell upon them in this place. But I wish you to remember that the same power which enables you to sense other objects by means of astral scenes is the same that is called into operation in the case which I have just referred. The astral is a wonderful plane or field of being, containing many strange and wonderful beings and things. The person living on the physical plane may visit the astral plane in the astral body and, again, he may perceive the happenings and scenes of that plane by means of the awkward and developed, the awakened, and developed astral senses. Some clairvoyants find it easy to function in one way and some in another. It is reserved for the scientifically developed clairvoyant to manifest the well-rounded power to perceive the phenomena of the astral plane in its wonderful entirety. Finally, you'll see by reference to other chapters of this book that one may manifest simple clairvoyant powers as well as the more complicated ones of time and space clairvoyants not only in the ordinary waking state, but also in the state of dreams. In fact, some of the most striking psychic phenomena are manifested when the seer is in a dream state. As we proceed, you will find that every phase of the great subject that will fit into its place and will be found to blend with every object of her phase. There will be found a logical harmony and unity of thought pervading the whole subject. But we must use single bricks and stones as we build. It is only in the completed structure that we may perceive the harmonious unity. Here is a lesson 17, personal psychic influence over others. There is some mention of the aura here. I assume that you're filled with a strong desire for a positive mental atmosphere around you. 
You want this very much indeed, and actually crave and hunger for it. Then you must begin to picture yourself in your imagination as surrounded with an aura of positive vat f vibrations, which protect you from the thought forces of other persons, and at the same time impress the strength of your personality upon the persons with whom you come in contact. You'll be aided in making these strong mental pictures by holding the idea in your concentrated thought and, at the same time, silently stating to your mind just what you expect to do in the desired direction. In stating your orders to your mind, always speak as if the thing were already accomplished at that particular moment. Never say that it will be, but always hold fast to the it is. The following will give you a good example of the mental statements, which of course sh should be accompanied by the concentrated idea of the thing and the mental picture of yourself as being just what you say. Here is the mental statement for the creation of a strong, positive psychic atmosphere. I'm surrounded by an aura of strong, positive, dynamic thought vibrations. These render me positive to other persons and render them negative to me. I'm positive to their thought vibrations, but they are negative to mine. They feel the strength of my psychic atmosphere while I easily repel the power of theirs. I dominate this situation and manifest my positive psychic qualities over theirs. My atmosphere creates a vibration of strength and power on all sides of me, which affect others with whom I come in contact. My psychic atmosphere is strong and positive. The previous chapter, I think that you can accomplish the seeing of the various auras simply by um, activating the clairvoyant vision by visualizing colors, whichever you wish, white being the simplest, but you may as well experiment with the other colors, but really I would just use white. And then um, feeling out an object or person nearby you and intending to see their vital emanations. And as you do this for a while, while also going into a deep state of relaxation, and clearing out any other thoughts, just concentrating on that, it should come through. I have seen the words of a person's um, by doing it this way. A lot of what Atkinson describes for seeing the aura seem far-fetched. It may work for others, but for me, simply understanding what it is you want to see and tuning in while very much relaxed and generating this light is the easiest way. And um, it, there's all different layers of aura. So if you want to see their emotional aura, just bring forth the idea of the emotional aura, hold the thought, and tend to see it. And you'll see that really colorful emotional aura. <laughs> And anything else you want to see in connection with a person, whether it's memories or general uh, defining experiences or other things, you can bring it up in much the same way. Let's see what else is to be said about Dora. This is from Lesson 20, Psychic and Magnetic Healing. I take the liberty of quoting here something on this subject from my little book entitled The Human Aura. In the chapter of that book devoted to consideration of the subject of auric magnetism, I said, in cases of magnetic healing, etc., the healer by an effort of his will, sometimes unconsciously applied, projects the supply of his pranic aura vibrations into the body of his patient by way of the nervous system of the patient, and also by means of what may be called the induction of the aura itself. The mere presence of a person strongly charged with prana is often enough to cause an overflow into the aura of other persons, with a resulting feeling of new strength and energy. By the use of the hands of the healer, a heightened effect is produced by reason of certain properties inherent in the nervous system of both healer and patient. There is even a flow of etheric substance from the aura of the healer to that 
of the patient in cases in which the vitality of the leader is very low. Many a healer has actually and literally pumped his life force and etheric substance into the body of his patient when the leader was sinking into the weakness which precedes death and has by so doing been able to bring back him back to strength and life. This is practically akin to the transfusion of blood, except that it's upon the psychic plane instead of the physical. But the true magnetic healer, call him by whatever name you wish, does not make this pranic treatment the all in all of his psychic treatment. On the contrary, it is but the less subtle part which leads up to the higher phases. While treating his patients by the laying on of hands, he, at the same time, strives to induce in the mind of the patient the mental image of restored health and physical strength. He pictures the diseased organ as restored to health and normal functioning. He sees the entire physiological machinery operating properly. The work of nutrition, assimilation, and extraction going on naturally and normally. By proper words of advice, L, and encouragement, he awakens hope and confidence in the mind of the patient, and thus obtains the cooperation of that mind and connection to his own mental efforts. The astral body responds to his treatment and begins to energize the physical organs and cells into normal activity, and a journey toward health has begun. In the little book just mentioned, The Human Aura, I, I give some valuable information regarding the influence of colors in psychic healing, which I do not reproduce here as it is outside the scope and field of the present lessons. Those who may feel interested in the subject are respectfully referred to the little manual itself. It is sold for a nominal price by the publisher of the present work. From Dynamic Thought The theory of dynamic thought also holds that in addition to the existence of the cosmic mind or ocean of mind principle and the lines of attraction that run through it each particle has its mental atmosphere or aura the aura is an atmosphere of mind that surrounds the particle and also the larger bodies and also living forms higher in the scale this aura is merely extension of the bit of mind that is segregated or apparently separated from the cosmic mind for use by the individual particle mass or creature. Through and by means of this aura, the particle takes cognizance of the approach and nature of the outer particles in its vicinity. The same rule holds good in the case of the creatures, including man, as we shall see in a later chapter. The fact is mentioned here merely in order to connect the several manifestations of mental phenomena mentioned in the several parts of this book. The individual mind is not closely confined within the substance in which it abides, but extends beyond the physical limits of the substance, sometimes to a quite considerable distance. The aura or egg-shaped projection or emanation of mind, surrounding each particle and each individual, is an instance of this. In addition to the aura, there is possibly an extension of mind to a considerable distance beyond the immediate vicinity of the physical limits. The connection, however, never being broken during the life term. Then he, like the particle, has an aura, or egg-shaped projection of mind and finer particles of psychoplasm which has been thrown off in the process of thought, and which clusters around him, producing a mental atmosphere, which constantly surrounds him and makes itself felt by those coming in his presence. Those who read these words may remember readily the feeling they have experienced when coming in contact with certain people, how some radiated an atmosphere of cheerfulness, brightness, etc., while others radiated the very opposite. Some radiate a feeling of energy, activity, etc., while others manifest just the reverse. Many likes and dislikes between people meeting for the first time arise in this way, each finding in the mental atmosphere of the others some inharmonious element. These radiations are perceived by others coming into the range. 
Occultists tell us that the character of a man's thought vibrations may be determined by certain colors, which are visible to those having astral sight. There is nothing so wonderful about this when it is remembered that various colors of light comprising the visible colors of spectrum, ranging from red on through orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and terminating in violet, arise simply from different rates of vibration of the particles of substance. And as thought is produced by mind causing vibrations in the psychoplasm, why is not the astral colors reasonable? We cannot stop to consider these colors in detail, but may run over to ones corresponding to each marked emotion of thought, as reported by the cult teachings. For instance, the shade of the thought manifesting in physical organic functions is of a colorless white or a color of clear water, and the color of the thought manifesting in fine force or vital energy is out of air, heated air rising from a furnace or a heated ground. When it emerges from the body, although of a faint pink when in the body itself, black represents hate, malice, etc. Gray, bright shade, represents selfishness, while gray of a dark, dull shade represents fear. Green represents jealousy, deceit, treachery, and similar emotions, ranging from the dull shades which characterize the lower and cruder forms, to the bright shades which characterize the finer or delicate forms of tact, politeness, diplomacy, etc. Red, dull shade, represents sensuality and passion, while red, bright and vivid, represents anger. Crimson, in varying shades, represents the phases of love. Brown represents avarice or greed. Orange represents pride and ambition, and yellow, in varying shades, represents grades of intellectual power. Blue is the color of the religious thoughts, ranging, however, through a great variety of stages, from the dull shade of superstitious religious belief to the beautiful violet of the highest religious emotion or thought. What is generally known as spirituality is characterized by a light blue of a peculiarly luminous shade, just as there are ultra-red and ultraviolet rays in the spectrum which the eye cannot perceive, so occultists inform us there are colors in the oral or mental atmosphere of a person of unusual psychic or occult development. The ultraviolet rays indicating the thought of one who is pursuing the higher planes of occult thought and unfoldment, while the ultra-red is evidenced by those possessing occult development, but who are using the same for base and selfish purposes. Black magic, in fact. There are other shades known to occultists indicating several highly developed states of mind, but it's needless to mention them here. But the influence of these particles of thought stuff thrown off from the mind psychoplasm under vibration produced by the mind during the process of thought does not cease with the phenomena surrounding the aura. They are rated to a considerable distance and produce a number of effects. We will remember how the corpuscles or electrons are thrown off by the substance in a high state of vibration. Well, the same law manifests in the vibrations dependent upon the production of thought. The particles are thrown off in great quantities, each vibrating at the rate imparted to it during the process. No, these particles of thought stuff do not compose the thought waves. They later belong to a different set of phenomena. In uh, the book Mind Power, A Glimpse of the Cult World, Chapter 22, is worth reading on the matter of auras and then there's one other chapter on uh mental atmosphere chapter 12 it is also worth reading however it is all things already said so we'll leave it to whoever wishes to uh, to go through it on their own. In 14 lessons uh, in Yoga, Philosophy, and Ordeal Occultism, there is a, number, uh, a lesson dealing with the human aura. Pretty quickly covers most everything about Dora. There's the color meanings.
descriptions of how it works. I can read the character. Hmm. Fourth lesson, Mantram. The mantram for the month is, I radiate thought waves of the kind and desire to receive from others. This main trim conveys a mighty occult truth and if conscientiously repeated and lived up to will enable you to make rapid progress in development and attainment. Give and you will receive measure for measure, kind for kind, color for color. Your thought waves extend far beyond the visible aura and affect others and draw to you the thoughts of others corresponding in character and quality with those sent out by you. Thought is the living force. Use it wisely. In the advanced courses on yoga philosophy, the student should endeavor to give a few minutes each day to silent meditation finding as quiet a place as possible and then lying or sitting in an easy position, relaxing every muscle of the body and calming the mind. Then when the proper conditions are observed, he will experience that peculiar sensation of calmness and quiet, which indicate the condition known as entering the silence. Then he should repeat the above mantra or similar one, there is no special virtue in the mere words, and should meditate along the lines indicated. The mantra, I am, if clearly understood and pressed upon the mind, will give this student an air of quiet dignity and calm manifestation of power, which will apparent to those with whom he comes in contact. It will surround him with a thought aura of strength and power. It will enable him to cast off fear and to look the world of men and women calmly in the eyes, knowing that he is an eternal soul and that not can really harm him. Even the more simple stages of his consciousness will lift one above the petty cares, worries, hates, fears, and jealousies of the lower mental states, and will cause one to be man or woman a, of the spirit in truth. Such people have a helpful effect upon those with whom they come in contact, as there is an undefinable aura surrounding them which causes others to recognize that they are worthy of confidence and respect. The mantram and meditation. Hmm. There's also an exercise that goes with it. Place your body in a relaxed reclining position. Breathe rhythmically and meditate upon the real self. Thinking of yourself as an entity independent of the body, although inhabiting it and being able to leave it at will. Think of yourself not as a body, but as a soul. Think of your body as but a shell, useful and comfortable, but merely an instrument for the convenience of the real you. Think of yourself as an independent being, using the body freely and to the best advantage, and having full control and mastery over it. While meditating, ignore the body entirely, and you will find that you will often become almost unconscious of it. You may even experience the sensation of being out of the body and of returning to it when through with this exercise. Rhythmic breathing is described in our little book, Science of Breath. Mantram and meditation. In connection with the above yoga exercise, the student may, if you desire, use the following mantram and meditation. I am. I assert the reality of my existence, not merely my physical existence, which is but temporal and relative, but my real existence in the spirit, which is eternal and absolute. I assert the reality of the ego, my soul, myself. The real I is the spirit principle, which is manifesting in body and mind, the highest expression of which I am conscious being myself, my soul. This I cannot die nor become annihilated. It may change the form of its expression or the vehicle of its manifestation. But it is always the same I, a bit of the universal spirit, a drop from the great ocean of spirit, a spiritual atom manifesting in my present consciousness, working toward perfect unfoldment. I am my soul, my soul is I. 
All the rest is but transitory and changeable. I am I. I am. I am. Repeat the words I am a number of times. <laughs> 